Who said 24? Oh my goodness. 521-1. Let's, let's say that all loud together. 521-1. And so we have history, and then we have letters, and then we have prophecy, right. History, letters, and prophecy. That's pretty much the breakdown. We're gonna, I'm going to have you look for a, a few books today uh, 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 to find them in your, your Bibles when we get to that. So, but we've been looking here in the, in the Gospel of John. If you want to open up today with me, the Gospel of John, chapter 3. We're, we've been talking about some very important stuff here in this first section of John, chapter 3. Uh, the first thing that he talks to in, in section 1 is that you must be what? Born again. You have to be, you must be born again. And it's not uh, an option. If you want to see the kingdom of heaven, if you want to go and enter the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, you must be born again. There's no other option, no other way, no other avenue besides being born again. To have a brand new life start within us. That's what it's all about. That's what it, it, it entails. So for you and I, you and I, uh, we have to keep that in mind and, and, and knowing that this is like God's plan. This is God's purpose. This is God's way. The second thing that we, we talked about, uh, the second must found in the, in the Gospel of John chapter 3 is that the Son of Man must be lifted up. So the necessity of the cross. For us to be born again, without the cross, there's no way for us to be born again. That was the avenue. That was the way for you and I to be born again was, was by the Son of Man being lifted up on the cross, that, his, that he would be exalted. And, and this idea that the cross, I can't get this out of my head, that the cross is, is really towering over all of humanity, all people over all time, this cross, the cross of Jesus Christ. As the snake, we read, as the snake was lifted up on a pole, and the people who were bitten by snakes, they had to look up to it and they would live. So Jesus was lifted up. He was lifted up on the cross and that all who would look up to him would live. So there was no other way. We had to look and live. The truth is that you and I, we, we've all been bitten by sin. We've all been bitten. That's the problem. You know, people think, well, you know, I'm okay. I'm a pretty good person. I'm, I'm going to make it into heaven, right? Because, you know, I haven't, I haven't, you know, killed anybody. I haven't, you know, done all kinds of bad stuff, robbed a bank. Yeah, thank you. I can't think of any bad stuff today. It's all bad, though, right? How many people have told lies? Oh, that's just a white lie. That's just, how many of us have, you know, uh, done things in our minds that we know are just not right. We're all, we're all sinners. We're all bitten by the sting of sin. And the only way for us to be forgiven is by looking up to the cross. Now today we kind of uh, get to, a, I, think, I think it's a very important verse, but I want to I show you some pictures here first. Look at that. That's like church. <laughs> you know, I heard that the Boston Red Sox like have some big games coming up. Is that true? Yeah. yeah. So it's kind of like sports fever right now. It's kind of like that. And I don't even know what team that is, to be honest with you. Uh, I can't pick it out. But what I want to point out to you is that right there. See, this is a big game that's happening here. And he's not excited about that, but I'm excited about that. How about this? This is a big game, too, and, and it's a little hard to see, but he has John 3.16 there. And, the, you know, and the uh, Vikings and the Steelers. And they, you know, you've got guys that go to the back of these things, and so they show these signs. And you, and you can watch games as you watch Sports, you can see if guys that have these sort of things up there. Let's see what else. That's kind of interesting. I'm not sure what he has in his hand right there. 
He's got a gun here, and yeah, probably a taser, and uh, maybe this guy's running through the field or something. Uh, it's hard to say. Uh, hopefully, we're not as offensive as that to have somebody chasing us with a taser, right? <laughs> hopefully. But it's hard to say. I got a couple little short videos I want to play for you now. Chris, can you, uh, can you run those for us, please? You got to make sure the volume's up and back it up. Can you tell the people about, I want to ask you about one part of the book. When you talk about on your eye black when you wrote 316 yeah. in the Bible, can you tell the people about the untamed coincidence that happened in a press conference a few years later? Yeah, well, we were playing for the national championship um, in college on January 8th, 2009. And I decided to wear John 3.16 under my eyes. And during the game, uh, 94 million people Googled John 3.16. And it was a pretty cool moment. Well, exactly three years later, we happened to be playing the Pittsburgh Steelers in the first round of the playoffs when I was with the Denver Broncos. And I didn't even know that it was exactly three years later. It was ja uh, January 12th. Or January 8th, 2012, exactly three years later to the day. I just went out there and tried to do whatever I could to win a playoff game. And afterwards, I'm going into the press conference because I love talking to media. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, our PR guy jumped in front of me and said, Tim, do you realize what happened? I was like, yeah, we just beat the Steelers. We're going to play the Patriots. And he's like, no, do you realize what happened? And I was like, all right, Patrick, what's up? He said, it's exactly three years later from the day that you wore John 315 in your eyes. I was like, oh, that's really cool. He said, no. I don't think you realize what happened. During the game, you threw for 316 yards. Your yards per rush were 3.16. Your yards per completion. Uh-oh. I was just starting to get into that. Can you, can you, try, to, can you try to fix that? I want to ask you about one part of the book. When you talk you about can, you can the forward it there. You wrote 316. Yeah. The day that you were down 316 in your eyes, I was like, oh, that's really cool. He said, no. I don't think you realize what happened. During the game, you threw for 316 yards. Your yards per rush were 3.16. Your yards per completion. Ah, it was a bad download. Anyways, he goes on to say that, you know, all these numbers were all 316. And uh, that's pretty incredible. But did you hear what he said? Uh, they Googled John 316 94 million times. 94 mil So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about being saved. John, if you were going to give one final sermon, like of all, you, how many sermons have you preached? I mean, thousands of them. Yes. But anyway, okay, if someone said, okay, you can give one last sermon. What would you preach on? What do you think your text would be? John 3, 16. Ah, okay. For God so loved the world. Yes. Why that? He gave his only begotten son. There's your gospel. It's all capsulized for you right there. Right there in a nutshell. It is right there, yes. I guess if you were going to have to pick one verse in all of the Bible that summarizes the gospel, you probably couldn't find a better verse than John 3, 16. I don't think you can. So that would be your final message you'd want to give. Yes. That's a beautiful one. When you're in heaven, how do you want? That's good. That's good. That's Pastor Chuck, as most of you know. And uh, he, uh, that was Greg Laurie who was interviewing there. And he, it was like his last interview that he did. And he passed away not too long uh, after that. But for him, the most important verse that he could think of that he would speak about was what? John 3.16. Is that amazing? So that's the verse that we're at today, interestingly enough. It's, it's uh, I'm sure, the most well-known verse in the Bible. I'm sure about that. The most well-known verse in the Bible. So knowing that, you know, I had a, a question, well, how do you speak on that? Everybody knows that verse. It's the the most well-known verse. And then the other question was, how do you not speak on that? Because it's the most well-known verse. And, and, but, but as I was thinking about it, and just thinking about this idea that people Googled it 94 million times, what does that tell us? They didn't know what it was, right? They saw it under his eye black 
you know, John 3.16, and, and uh, they didn't know what that was, so they Googled it to find out what that was. So that tells me that there's a lot of people in our country who do not know what John 3.16 is. Used to be, I think, it was very, very much well known. That's kind of disturbing in some ways uh, that people don't know it as much, but the opportunity, it just tells me the opportunity is great as well. Now, I don't know, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but how many, uh, you know, ask yourself, how many of you know what John 3.16 is by heart? How many of you have memorized? You know what it is. You don't have to raise your hand. I don't want people who don't to feel uh, uncomfortable. Or maybe you should. I don't know. Because if it's the most well-known verse in the Bible, we as Christians should probably know the most well-known verse in the Bible, right? I and mean, we should have a clue what that is. So, you know, looking at that, you know, I, I put it up on the screen in, in the King James Version because that's how I learned it as a young Christian. Just... But, you know, obviously you can take out the, the, the old type language. But, but let me just read it to you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. As, as Greg said, as Chuck was saying there, that's the gospel. It's all encapsulated. It's the gospel in a nutshell. Now, Kelly uh, knows uh, John 3.16 in five languages. Do you want to give us just one? Stand up and give us one. Not English. Yeah, all right. Hey, I like that. You know, uh, a few months back, we had lunch at the little uh, Mediterranean place around the corner from here, and the, the guy spoke Arabic, and Kelly quoted that to him. And he spoke English, too, but not, not so well, but, but I thought that was kind of cool. So, you know, this, this verse is so, it's got everything there. It's got, you know, the... The, the source of love, somebody said, the extent of love, the sacrifice of love, the results of love, it, it, you know, it, it's all there found in this verse. And so for you and I. Now, John Corson, he, he kind of gives this challenge when he's writing on it, uh, writing about this verse. And he says this, he says, to meditate on John 3.16 for 10 days, giving emphasis to a different word each day. He says, I believe it will come alive for you in new ways as you contemplate the enormity of its simplicity. So you, you take this verse and, and you, you look at one word, and we're going to kind of go through each word here in, in, in order. And I, I thought we'd, we'd use that as a template today. But to do that on your own, to do that in your own private time, I, I find in the middle of the night when I can't sleep is a good time to kind of think about some of these verses that I know. And there's, a, there's two or three that I always go back to, Psalm 23 and uh, the Lord's Prayer. And, but this is another good one here, John 3.16, to look at, just to meditate on, to think about what is he saying there. And you say, you know, for, for God so love the world, and, and that, so on and so forth. So let's just look there at, at, these verse, at this verse here, and, and we'll look at each word as we go along just uh, kind of quickly. Uh, so the first word is for, and for God so loved the word. The first, world, the first word is for, and it, it really, what he's saying there, he's looking back to what? To what he just said. Let's, let's read just what, what was just said there in verses uh, 14 and 15. He says... Let me find it here. He says, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone 
who believes in him may have eternal life. Again, he's talking about the cross. He's talking about faith in Jesus. And then he talks about eternal life there. And so then the, John 3.16 starts with this word for, for the cross, because of the cross, because of what he's just said, we can have eternal life. And then he goes on now to explain and give clarity. And where does it begin? Where does it end? Where is it all wrapped up? He says, for God. Really, it's all about God, isn't it? You know, God is the one that we're here for. You know, I don't know that any of you came here today just for a potluck. Or you came here today just because it was cold out and you wanted a warm place to go. I don't know that any of you came. I think that within each one of us, the reason we came here today was we want to meet with God. We want something of God in my life. I want to connect with God on some level, some plane. And I think that's why we're here. And, 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 and so the first thing he says is, for God so loved the world. It's all about God, isn't it? From beginning to end, it's all about God, what God has done. God, Genesis 1-1, created the heavens and the earth. All the way to the end of Revelation, where God has created a place. He's, he, he's got a place he's prepared for you and me. It's called heaven. God so loved the world. The next thing he says there is he says God so loved and and really there are two words there but it, the first one sort of tells us how much did he love. It says God so loved. How much did he love? So loved. And then he it, it really the meaning of the word is this in this way. For God in this way loved the world. Well, in what way? In the cross. How did he do it? How much did he do it? You think about the cross, you know, and, you, and, and I, I love this illustration of, you know, with young kids, you teach them, well, I love you. I love you more. And they say, no, I, I, I love you all the way up to that cloud, to the clouds up there. Well, no, I love you all the way up to Jesus. A little, little uh, Genevieve says, I love you all the way up to baby Jesus. She says, like, how can I, what's the comeback for that? <laughs> okay, you win. You know, but, but really, it's, you know, G Jesus, he stretched his arms out. He says, I love you this much. Isn't that what the cross says? I love you this much. And, and really, that's what it is, how he loved us in a way. One, uh, one Bible scholar said this, that defining this word so... He says, never seen in such fashion, such an extraordinary sight. That's how. That's how much. Never seen in anything like it before in such fashion, such an extraordinary sight. That he loved us in this kind of way, in this kind of fashion. You have to ask the question, why? Why did he do it? Why did he? Why did he go to the cross? Well, it, his motivation, he says, here is love. It's love. You know, I grew up, I grew up as a, a, a with the time of the Beatles, you know, and all you need is love. All together now, you know, it still comes back to me like these weird, you know, and, and uh, they were talking about something different, though. But the point of it is that What's mankind's greatest need? I believe it's love. The greatest need that you and I have is love. You know, why, why, you know, why do we go through all the trouble that we do? Because we want someone to care about us. We want someone to love us. We want to know that we are loved. That's difficult, though, sometimes, isn't it? Because some of us, at different times in our lives, we're just kind of unlovable. We'll get to that in a minute. But why did he do it? He, he loves you. I can say that clearly. He loves you. You want to know if anybody loves you? Well, well, Jesus loves you and he showed it. He proved it. He loves you. He loves me. But I don't think we always know that. 
I really don't. I think sometimes we, we're just not sure. We just we question it. We get distracted by so many other things. Ephesians 2 says this, Because of His great love for us, God who is rich in mercy, He made us alive with Christ. Why? Because of His great love for us. He loves you. He loves me. He loves the world, it says here. Now, God so loved the world, and, and, and so this word for world, what is he talking about there? Is he talking about the planet? God loves the, the rocks and the hills and the valleys. and the. He's talking about people. Now, he cares about the planet, don't get me wrong, he does, but he loves the people, he loves you and me. He created us. It, the, the human race was the crowning achievement of creation. The, the creation of man. The extent of his love is, is the whole human race. His love is for all people. So you could, you could put your name in there if you want to, and I think we probably should, as you're meditating on this verse, for God so loved me. You can put your name in there. Why? Because you're part of the world, aren't you? You're part of the whole human race, aren't you? I hope you are. If you're not, I, you're scaring me. I'm not sure what you are, some kind of, you know, apparition or some kind of creature. But you, you could have fooled me. You did fool me. So, so I could say, you know, for God so loves Zeke. For God so loved Zeke. You could, every one of you, I could go around the room and put your name in there too. For God so loved you. Do you know that? Do you believe that? Do you live like that? That's a question for each one of us, myself included, to ask. It says God so loved the world. He, he loved each one of us, the whole human race. He so loved. He didn't just say, I love you, though, did he? You know, we do that. Oh, I love you. I love you so much. And then we go and, and just ignore you. I love you, my wife but I'm going out to do my own thing now and I'm not, I don't really care what you think or what you, know, what you need right now. I'm going to go out and do what I need to do. Is that love? That's just a, a small example, but, but love really has action, right? True love has action. True love gets behind the words, not just words. You know, it's, it's, it's let us love with word and deed, not just with word. Let's put feet to our words, so to speak. So look what it says there. It says that he loved the world that he gave. He so loved the world that he gave. He gave his one and only son. He gave. He gave. You know, love gives. Sometimes we think that love only takes. Right? I love you, so what can you do for me? But love, Jesus showed us that it's, it's completely different than that. Love, if I love you, I'm going to give. I'm going to give to you. Love gave. He gave. Love gives. You think about Christmas time where it says, you know, we, we read Isaiah chapter 9, uh, verse 6. It says, for unto us a child is born, to us a son is what? Given. He gave. He gave his son. I want you to turn with me now, as I said, I want you to find some verses with me in the Bible. And these, first, let's start with 1 John chapter 4, and that's going to be right in the section right before the book of Revelation, so right near the end. 1 John chapter 4. Now, 1 John is what? What kind of book is it? It's a letter, right? And who was it written by? John. What John? The same John who wrote the Gospel of John, right? John the Apostle, he wrote this, these letters as well. There's three letters, 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. We're going to read just a couple of verses here in, in 1 John. 
chapter 4, verse 9. It's interesting, though, the context of the verses we're going to read about His love, God's love, is, is He's saying that we should love one another. But let's read verses 9 and 10. This is how God showed His love among us. He sent His one and only Son into the world that we might live through Him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us. And He sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. It was costly. He sent His Son as as an atoning sacrifice. The cross was costly. But He said, this is love, not that we loved God. In other words, we weren't loving Him. And He says, "It's, it's so easy to love you because you love me. In fact, we didn't love Him. We... It was actually the opposite. We wanted to have nothing to do with him. But he sent his one and only son into the world. He gave. This is love. He showed his love. He proved his love. We were unlovable. Yet he loved us. I find that kind of hard to do. Do you know people around you in your life that are just not very lovable. They're, in fact, they're unlovable. And yet, God loved us when we were unlovable and, and sometimes even asked us to, this is a, a little aside here, to love those people who are unlovable. That's kind of hard to do, isn't it? That's difficult sometimes. And I think, I think for me, the first thing, because I, I get my back up when someone's like that and I, you know, I just want to strike back, you know. But I think the first thing that we need to do is pray for them. Maybe then pray for ourselves. Help me to love that person, but pray for them. Obviously, there's a reason they're like that. And so for you and I to pray for them, not only, I think, does it help them, but it changes us. But the example that that we have here, that God loved us. He sent His Son. He loved us so much, He sent His Son Romans, I want you to turn with me to the book of Romans now. So you're going to go to the left. Kind of keep your, keep your hand in 1 John because we're going to come back sort of close near that in a minute. But I want you to turn back to Romans. Romans. That's Oh, you remember R.C. Gap? That's the R. Amazing, huh? So that means it comes right after Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. Romans. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. These are some amazing, amazing verses. Romans chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. Kind of keep this in the context of what we're talking about now, that, that God loved us, that he sent his son. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? There's a lot in those two verses there, but a a few I want to point out. One is, first of all, is that God is for us. God is for you. So many times we don't think that God is for me. He's he's not for me. He might be for that other guy, that really good Christian person. But he goes on to say, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how how will he not also along with him, graciously give us all things. So God is for you, and not only did he give his son for you, but he gave his only son for you, but he has other things. See, that was kind of like just the beginning. He graciously give you all things. You say, well, you're just like doing positive confession on me now. No, this is the Bible. I'm just, I'm just quoting what the Bible says here, that God wants to take care of you and me. He has a plan. He has a purpose. And he's for you. He's for me. If he gave us the best, the very best was his son. 
Uh, everything else is like small potatoes, right? Compared to that, everything else is little. If he gave us the very best already, the rest is easy for him. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish. That whosoever believes in him. That word whosoever, well, he, kind of, he sets it all up, and we see that in, this, in verse uh, John 3, 16. He sets it all up, really, for you and for me. But then it's like an open invitation, right? Does he force you to go through that door? Does he force you and I to, to make a decision? No, it's, it's whosoever. And this word, whosoever, means guess what? Whoever, yeah, whosoever. It means just what it says. Everybody, all, everyone, anyone. It includes all those. But whosoever, whosoever would believe, it's open to all. Everyone who believes. Everyone who believes. This word belief is, is really at the heart of, of our relationship with God. How do we get there by faith? What does it mean to believe? It means to have faith in. It means to trust in. So to trust in Jesus, to, to, to believe in him. Now, does that, does that end when we become believers? Oh, no. It just, it just begins, really, for you and I to keep trusting him through all the difficult things that we face in this life. Some definitions I found for this word for, for believe to think to be true, to be persuaded of, to credit, to place confidence in, to have faith directed unto. And I like this one, to give oneself up to. Not, you don't, we don't just trust in him, but we give ourselves up to him. Why? Because we trust him, because we believe in him. Who is he talking about here? He's talking about Jesus, right? Whoever, whosoever would believe in him. That is in Jesus, in his son, the son that he gave to us, should not perish. Now, that word perish, you know, it's, you say, well, you know, we don't like to use anything negative. We, don't, we, we only want to talk about positive things and and there are people who never use any kind of negative language, well, then you're going to have to take this word out of the most well-known verse in all the Bible. He says that as we believe, we will not perish. And the word perish means just what it says, to die, to be lost. The Bible Knowledge Commentary says this, about this word. It's not annihilation, but rather a final destiny of ruin in hell apart from God who is life, truth, and joy. The Bible describes it as an everlasting separation from God. That's what perishing is. And so to, for us to say, I'm never going to talk about that, but that's what, it, that's what the Bible is trying to get us not to do that we would not perish, that we would not be separated from God forever and ever. You remember I said, keep your finger in 1 John. I want you to turn back there now, but I want you to turn to 2 Peter, which is right before 1 John. 2 Peter chapter 3, I want you to see this. I want you to see these verses because we, we're looking at John 3.16. It says that we would perish. Whoever believes in him should not perish, shall not perish. But I want you to see part of what, what God's heart about this whole thing is. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. He says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. They were saying, you know, why don't, why don't you just wrap this whole thing up, God? You know, it's, it's time. It's, it's, it's time. We can't take much more of this. 
But there's going to be a day, and God's going to keep his promise, but the, the purpose behind it is this. He said, he is patient with you. And get this, get these words, not wanting anyone to what? Perish, but everyone to come to repentance. God's heart, God's will is that none of us would perish. Ezekiel, he says, I, God says, you know, I, I don't want any of you to die. I want you all to repent. I want you all to come to me. God's heart is, has been like that from day one. He doesn't want any of us to be separated from him. He doesn't want any human being to separate from him, but, but, he, but he's also given us free choice. And, and the sad thing is that we make this decision, we make this choice. Well, you know, I, I, I don't have time for that. I don't really want to get into that. I don't want to deal with that. And we miss the very best thing in all of life, which is eternal life. That we would not perish, but we would have eternal life or ever lasting life everlasting life we would have it we would own it we would possess it this eternal life this forever life that has no end that never ceases but the truth of the matter is eternal life doesn't start when we get to heaven does it it starts now we have eternal life. I have eternal life. I have everlasting life. Life begins now. But the wonderful thing, it goes on into eternity. Let's turn back to the Gospel of John. There's a few verses I want to look at as we, as we wrap this up here. John chapter 11 first. We're going to look at John chapter 11 and then John chapter 17. So back to the Gospel of John chapter 11. Verses 25 and 26. Jesus was there when Lazarus had died. His friend, his good friend had died and, and he went there. And, and so he's speaking about really life and death. And he's speaking to Lazarus' sister and... and uh, he says some very interesting words there in verses 25 and 26. He says, Jesus said to her, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? So he's talking about life and death there. He says that if you die and you are a believer, what will happen to you? It's not over. It's not over. You, you've just entered into the presence of Almighty God. You have just entered into that place that God has prepared. I think there is within man, I think with, within us, there's something that knows that there is more to life than just what we have to face here. Because if, if this is all there is, oh man... It's not always that nice. Now, there's some high moments, but there's a lot of low moments, isn't there? How many of you are having a low moment today? You wouldn't tell me anyways, would you? <laughs> he who believes in me will live even though he dies. But then he kind of turns it around. He says in verse 26, whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Now, is he talking about physical life? No, because Lazarus died again, you know. Lazarus was resurrected, but he died again, you know. He's not still walking around somewhere, like really old. But we'll never die that second death. The Bible calls it the second death. It's, it's, it's an eternal death. It's eternal separation, and we'll, we'll never die. Whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Do you really believe that you have eternal life? Well, John 3.16 says that, that whoever believes, whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting eternal life. So we're going to live even though we die. Life beyond this life. 
And we will live and never die that second death, that eternal death. And the last, last verse again, John 17. I want to close with that. John 17, verse 3. Jesus himself gives us a little definition. It's kind of cool, I think. He says in verse 3, Now this is eternal life. He's speaking to the Father in heaven. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That's why I say it. It doesn't begin once we, when we die and go to heaven. It begins now. It's having a relationship with God our Father forever, forever. And that's what He wants. He loves you. He loves me. And He wants us to be with Him forever. I read this. I like it. He said there are two kinds of books that always sell well, mysteries and love stories. That the gospel is both. It's a mystery long hidden, at last revealed. And it's a love story in the finest sense of that word. It unveils God's love for the world and for us. That's what we have here. The love story. And God wrote the book. John 3.16 kind of sums it all up for you and for me. What more can we say? Right? Let's just read that off the screen together, shall we? All together. Let's read it loud now. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Amen. Let's pray together, shall we? Our Father in heaven, we thank You for sending Your Son. You proved Your love. You showed what love is. Love is action. Someone said love is a verb. You gave. For each one of us, for each man, woman, and child on this planet, you love us so much, you want us to be with you forever and ever. And you didn't just want it, but you made the way, you, you paved the way. You proved your love and you, you offered your greatest sacrifice, your only son. that he died for our sins on that cross 2,000 years ago. That he paid the price for my sin, for the sin, sins of the whole world, for, for any who would believe in him, who would trust in him and receive the gift of eternal life. <coughs> it's, it is simple, Lord, but it's, it's majestically simple. Gloriously simple. That you, Jesus, were lifted up on that cross, exalted before the whole world. And all we need to do is look up and live because of what you did for us. Father, I pray you'd write these words, this verse on our hearts, on our minds. That we could know truly what eternal life is. Knowing you, Father, and Jesus, your Son, whom you sent. I hope and pray that each one of us has that relationship with God through Jesus. But if not, the way is open. It's so simple. It's just trusting in Him, believing, allowing Him into your life and heart. And you can pray with me right now. You can say, Jesus, please come into my heart. Come into my life and forgive me and, and be my Lord and be my Savior today. October 21st, 2018 that I would live forever, that I would have eternal life with you forever from this day forward. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand and sing together.